So this is part five, the final part of this um, first component to the non-iterative and iterative, iterative image reconstruction methods lecture, uh, where I'm just going to cover an intuitive example of iterative image reconstruction just to give a feel for what goes on with these methods. So uh, we've already seen this in the previous part of this lecture, so I'll uh, hurry through that. It's just showing that we're trying to estimate parameters f uh, to match some measured data vector g uh, using the matrix H that we looked at in the previous uh, video. Um, in that previous video, I also mentioned the matrix A, and so I'll take slightly longer to show what that does here. Um, now, instead of the back projected data G, we have a noisy measured sinogram M, and uh, now the parameters to estimate um, theta get forward model just using A and no longer H, um, and that model was a mean sinogram using the system modeling approach of the previous video. And um, then we can go ahead and compare with the objective function um, and then optimize, um, in other words, change the parameters theta such that when you forward model them through A, give a better model of the mean which better agrees with the noisy measured data. Um, this is that same flowchart just shown for some real pet data. So this is just a cross-section through a 3D reconstruction that was going on. This was FDG brain pet, and um, the system matrix here we will go into in far more detail at a later lecture after reading week, um, because um, this is uh, a lot more involved than just the line integrals, although the line integrals are a core component to that. Um, so there's the forward-modeled uh, sinogram. There was the actual measured sinogram, one of... Uh, probably about 800 to 1,000 or so for this uh, data set. Um, and then again, just uh, with the standard uh, iterative loop. And we're now going to go into an example of the very algorithm that was used on that real pet data. We're going to look intuitively at uh, the iterative reconstruction that is used um, on a clinical PET scanner. So uh, here it is, first of all, just... Um, in, um, in words and, and a basic matrix vector equation. Uh, what we do is we have some estimate of the reconstructed image at some uh, iteration k. So of course we understand these to really be not so much a, a 3D image but object representation parameters. These are the values, the coefficients for pixels or voxels that represent the radio tracer distribution inside the scanner's field of view. Um, with that current estimate k, uh, we forward model using our system matrix A. Uh, so again, to keep it simple, we'll just consider that as forward projecting along all the various lines of response of a scanner, of a PET scanner, for example, um, integrating through that image theta k. Uh, if we had knowledge of scatter and randoms, again, we'll go into this more in a later lecture, then we could have a, an additive component to model um, other components to the data. But for the moment, ignore that uh, background component. Um, that forward model is then compared element by element in this ratio. Um, this is like a, a vector, vector, element by element division um, compared in this ratio. So you can see here that if the forward, project forward projected value um, say in a particular sinogram bin, is greater than the actual measured value, uh, then this will give a value that's less than 1 for that sinogram bin. Or if this is smaller than the actual measured value, this will give a ratio that's greater than 1. So view it as like a correction factor in the data space, in the sinogram space. Um, so once we've got that correction factor, um, it's no good having that just in the measured data space, in the sinogram space, we need to get those correction factors back into the image. And so we back project by using the transpose of that matrix A. We know that A takes line integrals, so therefore the transpose just takes values and pastes them back down the lines from which um, the data came from, basically. So that smears all the data back into an image. Um, and that gets the correction factors now into, in quotes, image space, if you like. Um, which is now ready to be used to multiply, correctively multiply our current image estimate theta k. Um, 
We also normalize for the fact that these back projections, especially in 3D PET, they are going to be varying numbers of contributions because there are varying numbers of lines of response that pass through different locations in the field of view. So when we back project the data, we also count the number of back projections just by back projecting unit data and that effectively counts how many contributions hit each pixel or voxel so that when we back project those uh, correction factors, if you like, we correctly average them. Um, and then we're in good shape to do the multiplicative update of the image uh, to give an improved estimate of the object representation parameters, in other words, the, the reconstructed image. So that's intuitively um, a very well-known algorithm, which we'll go through rigorously uh, in a later lecture called Maximum Likelihood Expectation Maximization proposed way back in the 80s, um, but still the core methodology for most PET scanners, um, although some now are beginning to use regularized versions of this. So there are some manufacturers that do use this core component, but then add in a, a regularization component, which again we'll get to um, in later lectures. Okay, uh, there it was in matrix vector, and here it is in case there's any doubt about the uh, unusual matrix vector notation that we just used. I should maybe back up and say that this ratio is element by element. Uh, that's conventional matrix vector multiplication. The bit that's not clear here really is this vector here is multiplied element by element with this vector and this is also an element by element division. So this is non-standard notation, but um, it is a notation that has been increasingly picked up uh, by the field just for convenience compared to the explicit notation which I show here. Um, and so if you're in any doubt as to the matrix vector operations and the multiplications and divisions in that intuitive overview, then uh, feel free to pause the video and take a look at the subscript notation. That's exactly uh, what I just talked you through with the, with the matrix vector notation, but now fully written out in terms of elements of the matrix, elements of the vectors. Okay, so with that then, um, I'll now show you a MATLAB demo of that in process. So first of all, um, I'm going to show uh, an acquisition of some data. Um, so here, uh, this is just showing uh, a brain web phantom um, mimicking uh, an FDG distribution inside uh, the PET scanner field of view. And um, here you can see I've just got one back-to-back -back photon pair from one uh, emission site. So there was basically a positron emission at that location. This is showing you the true, and it's, so it's just giving you the location of one radioactive decay. And uh, positron annihilated with an electron, and we had a back-to-back -back photon pair shown in red there. And this is the back projected image, and this is the sinogram. So let's, um, let's keep this uh, running a bit more. Okay. Okay, so you can get the idea that it's, um, we're just simulating back-to-back -back photon pairs from that true distribution. This is showing the locations of the positron emissions, um, and this is showing the locations of the back-to-back -back photon pairs. For, for speed here, I am now simultaneously, uh, as you can see, doing multiple um, lines here just to speed up the visual display. Um, you should get the idea that this back-projected image is forming just by back projecting the data along the lines from which they were detected. And here this is the sinogram, just collecting the counts in sinogram format. So this is the radial distance of the line along that horizontal axis, and this vertical axis corresponds to the angle, the azimuthal angle of the line. So over time, um, you can begin to see, hopefully, the back projected image build up. Um, here, this which shows the emission sites, this would be analogous to perfect time of flight PET data where we'd be able to completely localize the site of positron electron annihilation. So even then it wouldn't quite be perfect because we want to actually have the point of positron emission rather than the location of annihilation. So there would be a blurring process in there. It would be a 
much simpler, well, I wouldn't go as far as deconvolution, but it would be a much simpler inverse problem to deal with. But when we're lacking the information, the time information, so here I'm showing non-time of flight, that means we have to do full back projection here, and that's why we get all that uncertainty as reflected in that image. Nonetheless, for basic PET reconstruction, uh, we are no nearly always using sinograms, as shown here. We don't use the back projected images, even though it looks like they might be making a comeback for time of flight uh, PET data. Okay, so that's shown um, enough of the acquisition. You can see that's now really shaping up quite well. Sinograms looking better. Let's uh, stop that. This is showing now um, just another take of the model of the mean. Um, had I known the true, that just showed a set of line integrals showing how we could uh, model the mean. Because I'm going to be using that, that model of the mean, the line integrals, now in the um, demonstration, intuitive dem dem demonstration of MLEM. Okay, so what we've got here then again is the reference true distribution. Um, and another reason for doing that quick model of the mean is that for a nice quality reconstruction here, I'm not going to take the noisy data, I'm going to take the noise-free measured sinogram that I got by forward projecting that true distribution. So this should be a better quality reconstruction. This is my uh, initial image estimate. Um, this is my initial image estimate, uniform uh, values everywhere, uniform radioactivity. And then what I'm going to do is forward project that, take it in ratio with the measured sinogram, back project, and then multiply. Okay, so that's what we're seeing here. So this is being forward projected. The sinogram is here. That's the measured sinogram divided by the model of the mean here. There's the ratio of the measured uh, to the model of the mean. That gets back projected in that box there. And then this gets multiplied uh, by the original. And so you can see um, that this reconstructed image, which started out as a uniform image, just by doing this succession of forward projections, and obviously doing the ratio and the back projection and the multiply, by doing that many, many times, now we're on to 15, um, this is getting closer and closer to the uh, ground truth distribution at the top left corner. So we'll just let that run a bit more. Um, hopefully you can believe that by the time this has carried on running uh, for many, many more iterations, obviously when there's no noise in the data, it's quite safe to let this carry on running, um, but you should be convinced it will actually converge nicely to that top left image. If noise was present um, in the sinogram data, then the number of iterations would be quite critical because we'd start to so closely fit the data that would be fitting the noise as well. And so we'd end up with quite a noisy distribution here. Um, hence the need for regularization and penalization strategies. But here, the goal here is to show you the core ingredients um, of iterative reconstruction, because it, as you can see, it's actually a very simple, intuitive process um, as visualized here. And, uh, We'll be going into the mathematics and the statistical derivation of this, um, but I just wanted to give you a feel up front for how iterative reconstruction works. So it's now up to um, 49, nearly up to 50 iterations. There we go, it stopped at 50. So um, I hope that's been informative and thanks for listening to this video. Thank you.